You want to hear about a great deal that'll save you money on something you're already buying? Ew, no. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I mean, I mean, yes, yes, I do. Well, then listen up, because this holiday season, the best deal in wireless is at Mint Mobile. Order and activate from home while getting premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. For a limited time, buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan and get three more months free by going to mintmobile.com slash A-L. Listen to The Astonishing Junk Drawer exclusively at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. Times and dates are Scott's kryptonite. He was really fascinated with how sideways that got. By the way, I'm going to publicly shame you. Scores of persons in the streets dropped unconscious and several of them died. The Wait. Betsphere. Oh, the Betsphere, yes, of course. Do you need to change your perspective? I don't think you're supposed to remember past lives. Also, mm-hmm. check for notes or an autograph. Sometimes there's one and they do. Oh, yeah. And when her grandmother died, she and her sister fought viciously over this ring. And nobody other than you folks will ever see it again. They're cosmic jokers after me. Astonishing Legends would like to thank BetterHelp, Squarespace, StoryWorth, Simply Safe, Skylight Frame, our contributors at patreon.com and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. The Parthenon, the Taj Mahal, Angkor Wat, Petra, the Great Pyramids. History remembers these monuments to humanity's imagination, engineering, and technical prowess. But it often forgets the people without whom none of those things would have been possible. The workers, who in many cases were enslaved, and even if not, They may as well have been, considering their limited options, finances, and the prejudices they often faced from the societies they were working so hard to build. In North America, one of the most significant accomplishments of the industrial age was the construction of railroad lines from coast to coast. Today, there are 94,000 miles of track in the United States alone, enough to circle the Earth at the equator nearly four times. When we look back on who actually did the hard labor of building these tracks, especially in the early days, immigrants were the ones doing the work, mainly Chinese and Irish immigrants. Tonight's Astonishing Legends is a tale of but one small subset of those groups. 39 Irish immigrants came to the U.S. from Ulster County on June 23, 1832 to help work on one of the most dangerous miles of Pennsylvania's main line, Duffy's Cut. In a little over 90 days, those 39 Irishmen and at least one woman, along with 18 others, would all be dead. The story might end there, but in death, it would seem that the 57 were determined to make sure this legend was told. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. The Irish canalers and diggers and haulers belong to a largely forgotten narrative of American history, that of the unskilled immigrant worker, Kevin Kenny from his book, The American Irish, A History. Join us tonight for part one of our series on the 190-year-old cover-up of murder at Duffy's Cut. And we're back. That we are, folks. Thanks for joining us tonight. And happy Thanksgiving. It would seem the end of 2022 is at hand. Speaking of which, we've had some difficulty getting holiday merch together this year. Hmm. But we are focusing on ramping things up in 2023. In the meanwhile, Astonishing Al was lurking around our darkened warehouse when he stumbled across some older products. Uh, Yes, he did. And a lot of people ask for those. Well, there are a few things from before Al got his facelift. Well, he's not going to like that. And they're in the store now. So if you head on over to AstonishingLegends.com and then you click on Shop and then you click on Legacy. It's first come, first serve. But one of the things there is a batch of astonishing beanies from an alternate universe. Uh, yeah, let's just say they didn't come out quite right, but they still qualify as <laughs> good enough. So if uh-huh. you're looking for one for the winter, look at those two. Well, we're a regulars as well. And we're also excited about tonight's show. So where do we start, sir? Well, part one of our two-part series on Duffy's Cut starts with us stumbling across a story from the New York Post back in November of 2021. The article was by Chris Bradford and was titled, How My Grandpa's Thanksgiving Ghost Story He Tells Each Year Led to Us Uncovering a 189-Year-Old Murder Mystery. (laughs) And it has a picture of these two guys, twin brothers, holding human remains that uh, obviously was recovered from an archaeological site. We thought, what in the world is going on here? 
Yeah, exactly. Well, the first thing I thought is, uh, did you write that title? Because that's one of the wa- kind of long ones you love to. Uh, to that's spell a out New York there. Post special right there. I yeah, know. That it's, was it, not it, my... No, but it's very intriguing. <laughs> it did the trick because we were uh, we were instantly intrigued and needed to know more about it. And we obviously love telling stories like this about uh, ghosts on astonishing legends, but we don't always get to connect those stories with real historical people. And, you know, and I'll just say this on the side is that that's what ghost hunters and researchers usually try to do. When you hear about a haunting, you try to find somebody who is a, who just fits that description. So you have a real anchor, you know, as we just said, it, it doesn't always happen because a lot of the time there's no way to do that. And as we pointed out, just like in the vertical plane series, you can't really ever tell what you might be communicating with or seeing in the case of a haunting. That's also true. And that also it can make it impossible. And it's not one-to-one. It's not necessarily you see somebody as an apparition and they had to have died there. But if they had, it it does make a connection. So, but then going to the flip side of that, yeah, there does seem to be evidence that sometimes you might be interacting with something that is pretending to be what used to be a real person, but it wasn't. But in this case, this is one of those stories where the ghosts in it seem to be doing that thing that's straight out of a classic haunting. They're appearing because they want the story of their heinous murders told, and they're not happy about being laid to rest in an unmarked grave on unconsecrated ground. Yeah, and the more we looked into this, the more it became multidimensional and extremely intense. And whatever was working to send a message to the Watson brothers was doing a pretty good job of it because what they uncovered and continue to uncover was perilously close to being lost to time. Mm. And the 57 Irish immigrants at the heart of this story deserve so much more than that. Yeah, and I hope we can do them justice because this was also one of those stories, and this has happened to us several times over the years now, that seemed to present itself to us. Yeah, and I don't even know how to describe that part of it, but I've learned to spot it now, and I think you have two fours. The closest thing I can compare (laughs) it to would be like going to some kind of business networking event to meet other people in your Mm -hmm. field or adjacent field so you can make contacts. When you do something like that, sometimes those pathways of action just light up. You can tell what you need to follow through on. And in this case, everything about it seems to be almost yelling, cover this. Mm -hmm. And you can tell it's happening because it's like when you sit out in your car for a rough morning commute. And for whatever reason, all the lights are green all the way to work. Lights that are never green are green. And you just sail on where you need to go. (laughs) And that's what was happening when we were when we were vetting this. As people ask us quite often, do you have a giant story folder? And we do. We keep adding stories and suggestions that people give to us, and we we do mark them all down. And it's a massive uh, list of ideas and thoughts and connections and this and that. So we often do look at stories and decide to cover them from this massive long list we've compiled. But a lot of the time, whether it's from the list or just something that pops up on the radar just like this, I always say it usually feels like the story has come to us. Yes. The story picked us. So in light of that, we decided to take the next step and reach out to Dr. William Watson and his brother Frank and see if they would be willing to come on the show and and tell us what Duffy's Cut was all about. And not only did they get back to us really quickly, they were happy to come on the show and do it on relatively short notice, which also took us aback. We were very pleasantly surprised, and it was another signed do the story. Yep. Green lights all the way. Green lights all the way. All right, Sarah. Well, let's roll that first part of our discussion with Bill and Frank. We would like to welcome Frank and Bill Watson to the show to talk to us about The Ghosts of Duffy's Cut. We had just finished an excellent book by them called The Ghosts of Duffy's Cut, The Irish Who Died Building America's Most Dangerous Stretch of Railroad, which the two of them worked on together along with John Ates, who has uh, passed away, and Earl Schandelmeyer. Uh, Gentlemen, this story really just kind of fell into our laps in a very quick way. It was not even in our pipeline. A lot of times we have things set up months and months in advance, but somehow events just seemed like they drove us to this story very quickly. I reached out to you and you both were like, yes, we'll come on. That was just a a week ago, really. So I want to thank you for joining us. Maybe you can introduce yourselves to our audience and tell them a little bit about yourself. Frank, you want to go first? You were 10 sure. minutes early. You're twins, right? That's the first yes, thing. You're twins, <laughs> yes. I'm uh, Frank Watson. I'm a Lutheran clergyman in New Jersey. I serve as the archivist for the Lutheran Church in New Jersey, and also I'm the president of the board of the Lutheran Archive Center in Philadelphia. That's about it for now. <laughs> okay. So I'm Bill Watson, 10 minutes later, um, <laughs> and I'm a history professor at Immaculata University. 
been there a quarter century, going to retire there in seven years. And that's, you know, PhD, University of Pennsylvania. So I have a, a, a background in European history. Never thought I'd be doing any kind of paranormal history, but that's certainly the obsession for the past two decades. Well, this is an amazing story, and we're thrilled to be covering it. I, the other thing I wanted to touch on really before we dove in, too, is uh, bagpipes. You, you guys both play bagpipes, is that correct? Yes, oh, yeah. for 42 years. Um, I was a solo competitor um, into grade one, competed all over the eastern seaboard for many years. It was a lot of fun, and we still pipe regularly. Weddings, funerals, parties, graduations. There's the ad. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll put your phone number or wh- your contact info. Well, in. we call ourselves uh, on some occasions actually the Duffy's Cut Pipers. Oh, same, really? Same here on, on my end. I competed solo and uh, we do a lot of gigs also at the University of Pennsylvania where I got my PhD. And actually, I played for myself uh, in the commencement in 1990. <laughs> that's kind of insane. Oh, that's I, I threw the robes on afterwards uh, over the kilt. <laughs> but uh, it's a part of our culture, a part of our life. Obviously, being twins, you, you seem like you're uh, close or at least have been. You both have doctorates. I mean, how similar has your path been over the years? We played hockey together as kids, you know. Um, we played uh, ice hockey, street hockey, have played in the same bagpipe bands, similar interests. My, my interest is in ecclesiastical history in particular, the 16th century, as well as the patristic period. But, you know, we, we have a great deal of interest together in, in terms of, of Irish history and, and Celtic history in general. And we're members of various societies. We're, we're members of, uh, besides the St. Andrew's Society of Philadelphia, we're also members of the friendly sons and daughters of St. Patrick, who have been great supporters of Duffy's Cut. And uh, we're active. Bill was on the board. I'm the membership chair. So. And by virtue of Catholicism, we do not share denominations uh, in the ancient order of Hibernians. Well, currently, the you, first... don't. You, you were baptized at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Hey, man, Church I jumped ship. I've been, I'm an employee of the Catholic Church for a quarter century now, but um, <laughs> I am Catholic. But the ancient order of Hibernians uh, was the first entity that took us seriously and donated uh, for okay. the uh, cause of trying to find these guys. Uh, the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick, as Frankie mentioned, now called the Friendly Sons and Daughters of St. Patrick. They went co ed about a year or two ago, have been uh, big donors as well. The thing to keep in mind about the Duffy's Cut project is that this was something that was unfunded for a very long time. And we had the official support of the IHMs at Immaculata for what we were doing, but there was no funding until about 10 years ago. And um, that's added an awful lot you know, to our ability to, to carry out the tasks. It's hard to imagine that's been, as Bill said, I mean, the lack of funding, it was carried on through volunteer efforts. You know, besides we had, it was funded by Mac uh, funding. That is, we went to the ATMs and got our own money for (laughs) tools at the beginning and and all sorts of things. But as time went on, thank God, you know, we had incredible volunteers, (laughs) scientists and everybody else who jumped on board, made a huge difference and made us able to take that huge leap to find the mass grave. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. And speaking of, you know, I love the holidays. It's one of my favorite times of the year. But on the other hand, because life is often ironic, it's also one of the most stressful and anxiety-ridden times of the year. I usually feel like I need a vacation after my holiday vacation. Oh, man, I, I always feel that way, too. The, the rushing around, getting the house ready for out-of-town visitors staying over. The spirits may be high, but so is the tension. Yes. I mean, I love all the company and good times, but... Uh, but I, it's a lot. And because, you know, irony, it's a lot of personalities to deal with. But for many folks, the holidays can be the loneliest time of the year. And you and I are lucky because we can commiserate and vent with each other, but we're not professionals, and neither are your closest friends and relatives, probably. They can only say so much, or more likely, they don't know what to say at all. If you're feeling overwhelmed, stuck, anxious, lost, stressed out, and without any answers, you need to talk to a professional. Someone with the skills to help you find the answers already within you. And that's where BetterHelp can really help. That convenience and affordability is a huge plus, and I've seen how therapy can help with learning coping skills, self-empowerment, dealing with trauma, all the tools you need to keep going, but also thrive doing it. Because unfortunately, life doesn't come with an owner's manual, but BetterHelp can be the next best thing. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. 
Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It, it couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com astonishing. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash astonishing. The season of giving is upon us once again. And also the season of selling, marketing, blogging, displaying, basically getting whatever you got going on out to the world while the giving is good. And you know the best way to do that. Yep, with your very own Squarespace website. Look, people, if you got something to present, market, or sell, don't make it hard for people to find you or pick up what you're putting down. There's just too much competition these days, too many other places to get what you're offering. As they say, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Like it or not, consumers are impressed by a website that looks stylish, modern, a site that feels safe and secure to buy from, not one that looks like it was slapped together in 2010 and hasn't been touched since then. Too right, mate. But Squarespace is the fun, easy, and affordable way to get all that for yourself because they have everything already built in that you're going to want. Squarespace has the tools you need to get your business off the ground, including e-commerce templates, inventory management, a simple checkout process, and secure payments. So whatever you sell, Squarespace has merchandising features to make your products look their best online. Not only that, Squarespace is so easy to use, you still have time to get your own site together for all that holiday shopping. Hey, if Horace can figure it out, you can too. Hey! But what if you just have creative work you want to showcase? Like you want to start a blog, for example, maybe for food or your crafting. Squarespace has powerful blogging tools to share recipes, photos, videos, and recommendations. Categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for you. Yeah, if you're making something with your hands or just writing about a topic, you can create your own community on your Squarespace website with a fully integrated commenting system that supports threaded comments, replies, and likes. No more excuses. It's time to launch that endeavor. If we waited until we thought we were ready, we'd never have launched anything. <laughs> also too right. And speaking of launching, head on over to squarespace.com legends for a free trial. And when you are ready to launch... Use the offer code LEGENDS to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash legends. This is Barry Corbett from Boston Paranormal. When we're not chasing after shadows, we're listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Let's back up a little bit for our listeners, because we probably will have explained a little bit about this before we get to this point. But in a nutshell, I guess, can you explain the big picture of the 57, why they came to be there and what happened to them after they got there? Oh, yeah, there's this call for uh, immigrants for the, uh, the Industrial Revolution all over the East Coast, the Erie Canal in New York. The CNO Canal in Maryland and the BNO Railroad. So there's there's actually about we calculated somewhere around ten thousand Irishmen who died building the infrastructure along the East Coast from the Erie Canal down to the New Orleans Canal. And this was a part of this whole movement west after you know the Louisiana Purchase. And so Pennsylvania had been the federal capital city of great importance without Philadelphia Continental Congresses, you know, where would they have been held? So we were the nerve center of a lot of early activity, and then we were being beaten out in the industry in the first couple years of the 1800s because of the uh, the uh, race out west after Louisiana Purchase put New York into Maryland, and Maryland in a much better situation than we were. So, you know, the calling of these Irishmen to come over here, as well as the use of certain technology and railroad construction, all comes from the British model. Well, we would use British uh, labor practices as well as mm -hmm. British technology. We know from the railroad file that the period where these men were hired. We know that it was it was the early summer of 1832. So the railroad file tells us that this is when they came to America. So we ended up going to the National Archives and searching through the shipping records. And um, we found the only ship that had a number of laborers on it from Ireland uh, that sailed from the port of Derry. It was the John Stamp with the captain, John Young. And we were able to research the ship as well as John Young's career as a captain. And there were 160 passengers on board, 100 men, 60 women, a number of kids, all boys over 15 years of age had an occupation. Because we knew from the file, the general time period, we were able to narrow the ship down. And, and we're, we're sure that this was the ship that brought our men and the women over. 
because Philip Duffy was already working with a number of Irish laborers at the adjacent mile of railroad, he had some with him, but he needed um, more labor and uh, it was a much more difficult task to build what was called mile mile 59. There were, there were actually uh, there was an earthen railroad bridge that had to be built. And again, while they used the British model of railroad building, this was untested technology in America. And so Duffy's sturdy band of the Sons of Aaron that he had with him in a previous mile, as the newspapers called it, um, needed to be supplemented. And so he hires this group that's off of the John Stamp. And there were 39 laborers on board that ship that he, we know that he hired that brought his number up to uh, 59. Uh, 57, rather. And their average age was 22. Uh, their average height when we excavated them, 5'6", heavily muscled. Horse teaming, ditch digging, fence making, things of that nature would have been the norm for these guys. But the thing to keep in mind about Ulster in that time, which is you know the, where the Protestants and Catholics in Ireland would eventually come to blows in modern times in the, in the Troubles in the 60s and the 90s, was always a place where Catholics were largely excluded from the economy. I mean, the economy is the basis of the troubles. You know, the fact that they couldn't get jobs and keep their housing, you had to move out of certain neighborhoods. But back in the 1800s, Catholics, the you know, only place in, in Ireland where they could work for money would have been in the Belfast dockyards. And they were literally at the bottom of the economic hierarchy there, working at the bottom of the ships. Protestants worked up top. And it's mirrored we would find in later years. This is not in um, in either of these books. This is something from found uh, j- during the corona year of 2020, uh, stuff Xerox that was in my basement, that the crew that finished up top was the same company that did the culvert at Duffy's Cut. And that's in our first book, J&J McCartney, mm. John and James McCartney, who we found out in 2020 were from County Down. That's, uh, you know, in the vicinity, Antrim is where Belfast is, and Down is an even more solidly Protestant county. And um, their crew finished up top after the Catholics who Duffy hired, Duffy himself being a Catholic, all died. But the men of uh, the McCartney brothers are never reported to have been persecuted in any way, and none of them died in the, the epidemic or in the murders. Uh, that was Duffy's guys. So there's a sectarian aspect to this that follows them across the Atlantic. Of course, Duffy being Catholic himself is no hero in this tale. As we were looking at the uh, the stories of these men, these laborers, and the women who came with them, we dug into the who Duffy was. Who was this man? The Duffy's Cut file just lists him as Duffy the contractor, and we were able through all sorts of sources, national archives, county archives, ecclesiastical archives, um, to, and railroad archives to piece his entire life together. And that was a fascinating thing because we know uh, he was born in 1783 in Ireland. He came to America in 1798, the year of the Wolf Tone Rebellion, the United Irishmen Rebellion, came to America as a boy at a time when his homeland was uh, having a very difficult period of, of, of an attempted um, independence from Great Britain. Uh, he eventually becomes a citizen in 1813 when his adopted country was also once again at war with uh, Great Britain. And we were able to trace him from birth to death by our persistence, basically, you know, by looking at all the different sources. But we found his life as a railroad contractor. We found about his um, work for the city of Philadelphia. He did all sorts of public works projects beyond the railroad and died so rich, his death certificate listed him as a gentleman. Ah, His death certificate listed him as a gentleman. Uh, we were fascinated by that. Yeah, so he made it. He he definitely... And, and his family refused to give him a... His family did not want to give him a tombstone when he died. Because he had a fairly bad reputation kicking Irish immigrants out of homes who were indentured to him in the Port Richmond section of Philadelphia. That brings a question up for me, because from your first book, it seemed like it wasn't necessarily completely clear what his disposition was. There were implications and there was guessing, but it sounds to me like since then, you've managed to nail more of that down. Yes, we know for a fact that it was only after his death, after Philip Duffy's death, Um, in April of 1871, that railroaders were free. The Irish American railroading public was free to tell the story of what actually happened there. So it's fascinating that within a year of his death, all of a sudden the Irish uh, railroading community is telling the story of what happened at Duffy's Cut. Okay. 
And uh, within a year, they put up a memorial. There's a, a wooden fence that gets put up, but it was his death. It took his death that allowed the Irish American community to tell the truth of what happened there. So it had been whispers prior to that. Yeah, there were ghost stories. There were whispers in the neighborhood. But it took Philip Duffy dying because he was a powerful man. Philip Duffy was a very powerful man. But they couldn't man. say anything publicly. Right. So that brings a question out that is in the, again, the first book, it makes it clear, but they were calling it uh, Dead Horse Hollow. They, were, they weren't calling it Duffy's Cut either until after his death. Or when did that come around? Or was that you guys that uncovered that? Because it went away, it was set, and then it, it was lost to time, and then you brought it back? Yeah. Yeah. Originally it would have been, and, it, and, and that's an interesting thing too, because paying off the dead horse is this... Uh, commentary about the lot of a lot of Irishmen who came over here. You get the contract to work somewhere, and by the time you get all the money, you're dead. You know, just like the lemon car today. You know, by the time you pay it off, it's gone. Right. Dead horse hollow. Skeptics early on said, oh, you're not going to find human remains down there. You're going to find horse bones. Well, there were some horse bones, but there sure as hell were human bones. <laughs> right. But after you, you have two books out now, and by the end of the first one, you hadn't found any remains yet. You had found artifacts where they had lived and, and dug some things up. So it was like, but we knew, we knew of course that you had found remains from the uh, Secrets of the Dead, the PBS episode that was on your story, which is great. People need to watch that. We'll have a link to it. But initially you were, you were able to confirm Dead Horse Hollow because there, the idea would have been, I guess, right? Yes, the new book, Massacre at Duffy's Cut, which is when I say new, came out in 2018. Everyone needs to find that. We'll have a link to it. The thing about this is, um, in terms of the dead horse hollow idea, aside from that being maybe metaphorical, also prior to the locomotives, the horses were pulling train cars on the on the tracks. So in theory, the railroad yeah. has all these horses oh, yeah. to do work and to pull the cars and all that, and they're dying. And there's an idea that when those horses die, that's where they were putting them as well. Yeah, yeah. And they did that too, in, in addition to the human bodies. Right, yeah, right. They had certain hours of the day, uh, horses pulled trains in this area. Locomotives had certain hours and tra horses had, had the rest of it. And it's, it's hard to imagine a, a railroad operating with horsepower, but that's the way it was in the 1830s. You know, it, would it took them so long to take a locomotive from Philadelphia out to Chester County. They, they took almost all day and they kept breaking down because they didn't have enough wood to run the, the burning of, of the, um, for the steam, the steam right. power. And it was just really kind of amazing. It's amazing to think about it, that they would run the railroad largely on horsepower for years. So there was a technological overlap. Yeah, yeah. And we've got that great uh, account by Deborah Bowman, who's a local Quaker girl, who talked in her diary about how the uh, railroad was being constructed in the neighborhood and how the railroad wanted to show how perfectly stable this was as a means of locomotion, that they, they had some guy going to town on a violin up top, be able to play some music. I mean, of course, horsepower comes from, you know, the fact that they originally used horses, but uh, thank you. Goodness, they uh, they changed that. This is a line that's still in existence, of course. Uh, right. The R5 Paoli Local goes out there, and also Amtrak. And I went past Duffy's Cut in, um, oh, good Lord, what year was that? Have been Maybe 08, out west towards Pittsburgh on an Amtrak train, uh, past what our men were building in 1832, going 80 miles an hour on an Amtrak train. What they built still stands. That's amazing. But they had to straighten the curve out over the years, right? They had to keep reworking it. Yeah, very experimental it was in the early days. And they would put these curves in. They just followed the local topography, largely. Um, and this was an earthen railroad bridge with curves. It's hard to imagine that. But that's really what was there at Duffy's Cut in 1832. At one point in, in the book, I think it said it was 150 feet, like that they had to build up from a ravine mm -hmm. is a, was that so technically you know we're having to look at this on google earth which i've looked at a lot it's one of my favorite things to do when we're covering something and it was so but technically this is like a, a ravine was there water running through at the bottom there's a creek yeah the valley creek runs through there and it the springs for that are about an eighth of a mile from duffy's cut we actually walked to the uh, source of the springs. Valley Creek becomes a very big body of water by the time you get to Valley Forge National Park. Okay. And, um, you know, it's a river practically. It's a small river, but it's it's not just a stream like it is at the cut. And so the farmers wanted them to preserve this. And so Duffy's work commenced after the McCartney brothers had constructed a culvert over that creek, which still stands. Mm -hmm. So the earthen fill went over that uh, culvert 
And I've, right. I've, 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 we've all walked through that culvert. I once knocked myself out in there and had quite a scar on my head. Uh, they, they, they're continuing to um, bolster it because of the, uh, the constant movement of trains over that. They don't want it to collapse. So it's getting smaller and smaller every year. Oh, right, because they have to bolster it internally. And illegal. I mean, you can't go through it now. Okay, so that's the history of the workers at large and, and then the big picture. But the other connection for you guys is your grandfather, right? He worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad that was building Duffy's Cut. And then we read in that New York Post story that he used to tell you guys a ghost story every Thanksgiving when you were kids. Our grandfather, Joseph Trippesen, was a railroad executive who worked under Martin Clement, who had been president of the Pennsylvania Railroad and just so happened to be the railroader who put the file that Bill and I um, have relied on so intensely, put it together starting in 1909. And really at the heart of that story is a ghost story. The heart of the telling of the tale from the Pennsylvania Railroad file is this ghost story from 1832. And our grandfather actually related that to us at, on Thanksgiving. And we had the, all the family together on the front porch of this beautiful suburban house in suburban Philadelphia, outside of Philly. And he brought out his transcript of this ghost story and he read it to us. And I remember as a boy, it was just, it just struck you that, you know, the, the fact that there was a, a man walking down the railroad tracks and he saw a ghost, not just a ghost, a bunch of ghosts dancing. And it just, it was an enthralling, and it was just kind of dragged us into the story in a different way than we did as adults, of course. But Bill and I were taken along railroad tracks by our grandfather, and he told us railroad lore and legends as young children. But it was the ghost story that he read to us that at least was the start for what became Duffy's Cut. All right, so we did want to share that story in the context of their book, The Ghosts of Duffy's Cut, which, by the way, is excellent. Pick it up if you're into this story. There's a lot more information mm -hmm. in there. For context, Duffy's Cut is in Chester County in eastern Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. We're paraphrasing a bit for the sake of the show, but here's that original story taken from the book. In August of 1832, just a few weeks after the last man died at Duffy's Cut, Chester County historian Julian Saxe gathered a story from a local unidentified, quote, old resident, end quote. It was on a warm, murky night in September. I was down to the Green Tree Tavern and started walking home on the railroad. The night was hot and foggy, so I trudged up between the stone blocks, which are the railroad sills on which the tracks were laid, until I got up on the fill or man-made earthen hill, and there I saw with my eyes the ghosts of the Irishman who died with the cholera a month ago a dancing around the big trench where they were buried. It's true, mister, it was awful. They looked as if they were a kind of green and blue fire, and there they were a-hopping and a-bobbing on their graves. I had heard the Irishmen were a-haunting the place because they were buried without the benefit of the clergy, as they said. It is a matter of fact that for years the immediate locality was shunned by many residents of the vicinity under the belief that the spot was haunted and many gruesome tales were told of ghostly sights, which it was claimed were seen in the hollow by the roadside. Okay, so that's the Thanksgiving ghost story, but that's not the only thing that seemed to present itself to you, was it, Bill? It's important to note, though, that I, I had a much uh, dimmer recollection of, of that specific telling by our grandfather. So that when I saw something, it wasn't just me, it was my buddy Tom Connor as well, in the year 2000, that was the farthest thing from my mind. I had no idea what I saw until two years later when I looked in this file and I said, that's our grandfather's file and that's the story that he told us and that's exactly what I saw. That's what Tom Connor and I saw. Tom saw it first. That was the aha moment. It was like a match on a, on a maybe an empty matchbook because who would have figured out? First of all, if he didn't have the file and I didn't have the job and I didn't stop at Immaculata at 10 o'clock at night, which is within the scope of Duffy's mile, the one mile, mile 59 on the Philadelphia and Columbia, uh, where I'm sure some of the guys walked back in 1832. But I had no idea about any of that when I saw something there that night. It was in September of the year 2000, coming back from a bagpipe gig in Lancaster with Tom Connor. And I had not had anything to drink that night. And I had never in my life before seen ghosts. And I was always skeptical when I saw something on TV about ghosts. I mean, there's you know, shows are, you know, I think mostly contrived. 
anyway, uh, he had to hit the uh, restroom on the way back from Lancaster. It was a, a World War II Marine Corps veterans reunion that we had just played, and we had a long drive. It was about an hour back to where I am here in Springfield, and then he had another half hour to get back to his house in South Jersey. And I said, sure, we'll hit Immaculata. We'll go to the men's room. We, we need to, you know, get watered and drained. And um, he was in the part near the window, and he said, Billy, what am I looking at? And I've got to tell you, 10 o'clock at night, college campus out in the suburbs, there's not much going on. There aren't many people out there. He, he saw it first, and then I saw the same exact thing he saw, which was three shapes of men out on the lawn in front of the uh, faculty center that uh, had no reason to be there. They were shining uh, in the same way Tom and I both said the same exact thing. It was like the Star Trek uh, transporter in the original series. I mean, there's nothing I ever saw like that before. It reminded me kind of of, of neon art, however, that I'd seen down at the art museum in Philly. When you turn right to go towards the uh, gift shop in the cafeteria at the Philadelphia Art Museum, they had neon art, neon lights bent in the shape of various things. And I, I said, yeah, I looked at what he saw at the little slit of a window, kind of like a tank slit we're looking at there and feel the breeze coming in the window. It, lo it looked like art. And I said, yeah, can you imagine somebody might pay for that? That's what I said. It looked like art. <laughs> and right across that lawn was where there was an art show that we had every year at Immaculata in the gym. And I said, yeah, somebody's actually paying for that. And then, then, it, then it vanished. I had no explanation for that. He didn't have any explanation. Nobody knew we were there. So even if somebody wanted to play a trick on us, they would have had to have paid for a Hollywood special effect. That's how good it was. And um, they, they were there and then they weren't there. And we went outside and said, what the hell just happened? There was nothing outside that could have corresponded to what we saw. I never saw anything before like that in my life. I never saw anything like that after. I know what I saw. I saw that, and he saw that. He saw it first. We were the only guys within, I don't know how many miles from there, you know, who could have maybe possibly been able to put something together. But that happens to correspond exactly with when the condos went in above that spot. And by the way, when this story began to hit the local newspapers that we were searching for an Irish railroader's mass grave, everyone who lived in that cul-de-sac in that condo came to us at Immaculata and told me and John Ates stories of things that they had experienced in that condo that were remarkably similar to what I'd seen, and including the story of a, of a woman in black, which we put together in 2015, you know, many, many years later. I mean, we're talking about 2000 to 2015. We, we put this together right before we took the set of a woman uh, named Catherine Burns, a 29-year-old female, back to her home county of Tyrone to rebury in Ireland, that she would have been wearing black. She was a widow. You know, I'm, I'm originally a medievalist, all right? I mean, my, my field was the, uh, the time of Charlemagne, okay, 800s, 700s, 800s, 900s AD, and my dissertation. And later I... Uh, I made that into a book, uh, Tricolor and Crescent, France in the Islamic World. Hey, a little plug. This is long. I don't even know if you can even find this out there anymore, except on Amazon. Yes, yeah. But um, <laughs> anyway, it has nothing Shameless to do with time. folklore. It has nothing to do with uh, ghosts. And I'd never seen anything before like it. But all I know is that for the next couple of weeks, I asked all the old timers in the building, in the faculty center at Immaculata, hey, is there any kind of folklore about ghosts associated with this campus. Now, there had been a battle fought there, the Battle of the Clouds, in between the Battle of Brandywine first and the Battle of Paley. In between that was the Battle of the Clouds, and Washington was there, the British were there, and shots were fired and some people were killed. There have been skeletons excavated on the edges and the outer lying properties, and a British officer's crossbow buckle and a cannonball had been found on campus. But they said, nah, there's no ghost stories. There's nothing at all like that. And it wasn't until two years later up at Frank's house in New Jersey for um, uh, Labor Day. We went up there with my mother and my family went up and I said, look, I'm going to give you some of our grandfather's papers that are, were from our mother's house. And my mother said, yes, they should be distributed so that in case something happens to one of us, some of that stuff's going to survive and his memory is going to survive. And Frankie said, well, I've got something here that he had in his possession, and that was this railroad file. I said, well, that's interesting. Let me see. And then the first thing that struck my mind was that on the cover of this file, it says between Malvern and Frazier, Duffy's Cut enclosure, stone enclosure between Malvern and Frazier. I said, Frankie, you realize that's where I work? That this guy from 1832, when you open up the file, that's the first thing you see, this account of a guy walking down the tracks in 1832, and he sees these shining figures. And it corresponded almost exactly with what Tom and I had seen. He called them fiery figures. We said it was like neon lights. He didn't live now. If I lived back in his day, I would have called it fiery figures. But that is what led 
to this. There's no, there's no question about it that these things yeah. together, you can forget about it ever happened. And and we have the railroad's auction book of everything that was auctioned off, all the documents, and that file could have ended up in a miscellaneous bundle of documents and ended up in Wyoming, and this never would have happened. But our grandfather grabbed it, and thank God Frankie had it, and I saw something. And, and again, it's like a match in a matchbook. Boom, all of a sudden this thing got started. Did he have a lot of other material as well, or was this kind of it, just this one file? Oh, yeah. Oh, we, okay. have, a, we have a lot of other material. A lot of miscellaneous papers. Uh, you he know. was a railroad historian. Yeah, so he had he had a lot of original materials. He worked under four presidents and and had uh, he was yeah, the original materials yeah. of some of the original surveys of the railroad. Fascinating, but you know the fact that that Bill was up at my place on on Labor Day, reflecting on this in time, you know the fact that these laborers. They, this is a story of laborers who who tried to get a piece of the American dream and uh, who were cheated, you know, who were murdered before they could they could make a name or, or, or establish any kind of history in this country, and they were killed uh, because of who they were. We decided, let's investigate Granddad's story and Bill's story and uh, on Labor Day weekend. There's something very telling about that. The workers who didn't get anyone to stand by them who were let to die in this horrible situation out at Duffy's Cut in 1832. There's something to that, I think, right, Bill? I mean, there's a lot of coincidences here. I mean, the timing of the uh, sighting, John Ates, uh, I brought him out that semester to do Irish history at Immaculata. Of course, I do now myself. But John was going into Irish history. And um, he said, you guys realize that this was an ember night in the old Catholic calendar when people thought souls came out of purgatory to look for people to help them, to pray for them and to help them. The hair stood up on my neck. I said, how the hell is any of this possible? This was beyond the realm of coincidence. I mean, when you go into the other coincidence too, the fact that the guy who put that file together was living on Immaculata before it was Immaculata, where the sister of the guy who found the skeletons back in 1870 and moved them to where they are under the stone monument. It's insane, the level of coincidence here. Wait, so the night that you, that you and Tom saw, that was an ember night? The night that you saw what you saw? Yeah. Wow. Ember nights are the Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday after four uh, fixed dates to kind of guide the year. And this would have been the autumnal Ember night that corresponded. This is the Wednesday and Friday and Saturday after Holy Cross Day. This holiday season, we wanted to give a unique gift to our loved ones that make them feel special, just like they are, and the relationship we share. That's why we're giving everyone we care about StoryWorth. Well, StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. It's a thoughtful and meaningful gift that connects you to those who matter most, which is why I recently got it for my hard to shop for dad. And honestly, I can't wait to see what he's written so far. I have so many questions. Well, why don't you tell everyone how StoryWorth works? It really is a pretty cool idea. It's actually so cool, I wished I'd thought of it. So every <laughs> week, StoryWorth emails your relative or friend a thought-provoking question of your choice from their vast pool of possible options. Each unique prompt asks questions you've never thought to ask, like, what's the bravest thing you've ever done in your life? Or if you could see into the future, what would you want to find out? Yeah, you know, I asked my dad what his earliest memories were of growing up with my grandparents. And, you know, I've heard the stories, of course, but not the whole story. And you got to ask while well, they can still remember. Oh, yeah, we both know those stories really change over the years. But now here's the really cool part. After one year, StoryWorth will compile all of your loved one's stories, including photos, into a beautiful keepsake book that you'll be able to share and revisit for generations to come. Reading the weekly stories helps connect you with your loved ones, no matter how near or far apart you are. And I love how it's getting both my parents to remember so many interesting details from their life, like how they both met while he was in the army. Or that time as a kid, some friends of his lit a JATO or jet-assisted takeoff rocket they were hoping to launch into the sky, but it fell over and shot across the highway. Um, I have questions. <laughs> uh, I have questions when we're done here. In the meantime, with StoryWorth, we're giving those we love most a thoughtful, personal gift from the heart and preserving their memories and stories for years to come. Go to StoryWorth.com slash legends and save $10 on your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash legends to save $10 on your first purchase. All right, so when, did it hit the Jersey barrier on the other side? It just shot across the field? No, I did. Well, Nobody the, ran off the, the road? Cars, uh, it went between cars. That's, that story could have well, gone. We'll
Uh, Forrest, did you know that over the holidays, property crimes like burglaries and package thefts spike nationally? Yeah, you just have to turn on any news or ask some of your neighbors. But that's why our friends at Simply Safe Home Security are offering 50% off their award winning security system so that more families can feel safe and secure this holiday season. Order your Simply Safe system for half off today and enjoy advanced security and greater peace of mind this holiday season. And here's why I love it. Remember last time I was talking about my janky old security system and you were poking fun at me? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I, I like poking fun at you. Uh huh. Well, after that one, when the tech finally came around, I got one of those digital cameras that hook up to the internet, but I was still praying no one broke in because, yeah, I would have some video of jerks stealing my stuff and messing up my place. And maybe I'd see a notification in time, but that would be it, and I would have zero help. And that's exactly why everyone needs a Simply Safe security system. You see, in an emergency, 24 7 professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get priority police response. Oh yeah, priority response is something you hope you never need, but if you, your family, or your stuff is under threat, that's exactly what you want and need. And I feel safe knowing that not only do I have a much better HD camera, but now I have advanced sensors for the vulnerable entries and a motion detector that's got my back. And that is why everyone needs what U.S. News and World Report named the best home security system of 2022 for the third year in a row. Plus, you can have hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. And it's affordable. 24-7 professional monitoring service costs under $1 a day, less than half the price of ADT's traditional professionally installed system. Don't miss your chance for massive savings on our favorite security system. And get 50% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash AL today. This is their biggest discount of the year, folks. That's simplysafe.com slash AL. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Hello, everyone. I'm Rachel Parsons, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. There's just so much going on here from a paranormal perspective. I mean, it's more than just one sighting, right? It's a lot of things happening over 200 years. But even more than that, Bill's sighting matches the one from 1832. And then on top of that, it falls on a significant day on the Catholic calendar. And this story is about Irish Catholic immigrants being murdered and buried in unmarked graves. It's just all smacking these guys in the face. That's right, man. This is still only the tip of the coincidence iceberg. Indeed. So what you got to remember here now is that at this point, the Duffy's Cut Project has actually recovered human remains. And once they did that, a whole manner of things changed. But again, in the realm of the paranormal, take a listen to what Frank and Bill have to say here in the next segment about the wildlife in the cut before and after they discovered those. Yeah, it's just a crazy, I mean, it, it, no, nobody, look at it. You go from this insane story to skeletons to reburying two of them in Ireland. This is not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. No one involved in the excavations thought that those ghost stories were bogus. And nobody who, who looked at a skeleton, historians doing the work of archaeologists, because the pen where I got my PhD, the uh, anthropology department down there came out to help us. Janet Monge, the uh, physical anthropologist, and her assistant, Samantha Cox, mm -hmm. ran the dig, who'd excavated hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of skeletons over the years. Nobody, nobody on our side, on the historian side, thought that this was a coincidence or that ever doubted the ghost stories. And Frankie, am I right about nobody ever heard anything until the skeletons were found in that valley? Exactly. No, that's a very good point. When we were excavating the shanty where these men and the women lived and died, you'd be down there. We were down there every Friday, our days off for Friday during the weekend. We'd excavate for hours and we just didn't hear anything. There was no sound of wildlife, even though it's a forest, basically. And it was after we found the first body, John Ruddy, in March of 2009, that all of a sudden we started noticing and hearing wildlife. We'd see these little frogs, we'd hear the noise of, of a fox in the distance or whatever it might be, you know, birds chirping more so as well. And that was Jim Kane. Tell him it was a cop who said that. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a cop who, who made that comment. Jim Kane, yeah, a friend of ours who's, a, he's a retired, um, Port Authority police detective sergeant, you know, so he's he's a man who looks at at evidence and he that's what he said. And we we agreed with him because it's 
Cheap. Until he said it, though, until we started thinking about it. That it was a dead zone. It's a, it was a dead zone. Bill, can you describe what the figures look like? Did you get any sense of anything descriptive? Like, did they seem vintage to you? Could you make out any detail on, on the, the shape? And, and they were standing in a kind of an odd arms out uh, position, right? Yeah, they were standing with their arms out to the sides, you know, legs, not that attention, but sort of, you know, in an odd, you know, a, a not enough way that it looked like art. It didn't look like three characters just standing there. They were trying to get my attention and Tom's attention. By the way, Tom's uh, grandfather was kicked out of Ireland in 1920 for siding with the wrong side in the Irish Civil War. There couldn't have been two more perfect people there that night to see this thing. And I think we were all meant to uh, get involved in this. But no, they were um, like whitish looking light and... Um, there's nothing outside that window. I know because I use that men's room every day. There's nothing there. There are no lights. There's no special <laughs> effects. But that night, on that occasion, there was something there that is not normally there. I know what I saw, and I, I know that this is this led to this. Our buddy Tom Connor, who was there with Bill that day, um, was with us then after we Bill and I decided, let's look at our grandfather's file and try to find Duffy's cut in, uh, in, in 2002. And yeah. on Columbus Day of 2002, we found the site, which was fascinating because yeah. Tom, Bill, and I had our kids with us. They were off on the, on the holiday of Columbus Day weekend, and we were out there on the day of Columbus Day looking for, I mean, walking along the railroad tracks, trying to find a site that we really, we knew there it was in between one mile of railroad we weren't even supposed to be out there technically we shouldn't have been walking along the track but tom was with us when we found it there was a guy walking a dog in the development where this site is located he was smoking a stogie and uh he was walking his dog and i went up to him and i said hey man do you know anything about an old stone railroad monument and he <laughs> says follow me <laughs> and I screamed down to, to Bill and to Tom, hey, guys, I think we're going to find it. And then Bill and I raced up. We were running like lunatics. And all of a sudden, there was this stone monument. And again, Tom was there with us that day. It's very fitting that he was there when we found it. And um, all of a sudden, the story that our grandfather told and the story that Bill experienced kind of had this coming together, physical coming together in this place. It was really a, a surreal moment that we found, we discovered by sheer happenstance that afternoon, the site uh, where where all this took place. In terms of local lore, even though that you might not have even been aware of it, right, prior to this, but there were other local mm -hmm. stories, like folks that came out, there's some in your first book, there was somebody who lived right there on Oak Hill Circle, which is right adjacent to it, even before, who grew up there before the condos were built in 2000. He described yeah. things happening in Duffy's Cut as well, right? Yeah, Brian Rach. Yeah. Brian came to us, in addition to all the people who lived in the cul-de-sac, and told the story of how he and his uh, childhood friends wandered into the woods, and some of them found bones. And it's not beyond the realm of possibility that they could have been human bones. And they all believed that they were haunted and had to take those things back. Every single person in that cul-de-sac came to us to tell us their stories. And they supported our, our endeavors wholeheartedly. The first part of that development to be constructed was right there. You know, right. everyone saw something, including, you know, the story of the woman in black uh, by a, a member of the, a local chamber of commerce, a very serious guy, but whose hands were shaking when he had to tell the story in the green room at Immaculata. It was like something out of a movie. She appeared inside his house? Outside and then inside. And inside. Peering through the window and then inside. Oh, right. What kinds of things were other people seeing? Faces looking through windows. Faces, Yeah. Second floor windows, right? Yeah, there, there were repeated... Faces just appearing in windows, looking in the houses, things like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's sightings of people and uh, otherwise unexplainable stories until, again, two years later, when we found this piece of the puzzle that finally got put together, and then we began our investigation. But first thing, of course, is the battle to get that historical marker. That was, I mean, that caused, um, you know, I've lost all my hair. I'm, I feel like I'm 100 years old because of that. <laughs> that was insane to get that marker. Um, and planting that in the ground was like Iwo Jima for us. It was crazy. Our battle, you know, we had to get 4,000 signatures. We got that marker. We put that in right there at the nearest intersection of King and Sugartown, close to the site. And that right beyond that is the development where everybody saw the ghosts. And right beyond that is the stone monument and the tracks. Yeah, I was going to say, Bill, what's, what's cool about the marker is, is that, the Irish laborers who were living and working in that valley 
would have known, they probably would have walked in the area where the sign is located. People have said to us, where would they have worked? And it's very clear where they worked because the railroad still rides over that spot. But they weren't, when they were working there before cholera hit the work camp, they probably would have all wandered around that area at some point where the marker is. So there's like that sacred ground too, where the marker is. It's not just the site of the stone wall, but up by the marker, that would have been their their neighborhood in a sense. Well, there's another story in the, in the first book, again, about somebody who actually saw something by the marker, right? Yeah, and that's more recent. Yes. That was subsequent, I think, to many of the other stories. But there's a persistent folklore there, which, by the way, seems to have ceased after we excavated skeletons. We've gotten no reports of anyone seeing anything else. Man, I was looking at all of this on Google Earth, and Oak Hill Circle mm-hmm. is is right there, just west of where they've been working. And when Bill and yeah. Frank mentioned the cul-de-sac, they're talking about some newer condos that were built in 2000, which are a lot closer. In fact, that memorial is like in the backyard of one of those, practically. <laughs> Not even practically. It, it's literally in the backyard of one of these new condos from 2000. But Oak Hill Circle was there a long time before that. We got permission right. from them to share that Oak Hill story here. So I'm just going to read that from their book. I've been reading through some of the recent news postings regarding Duffy's Cut and the mass grave of the 57 Irish railroad workers, and I'm happy to hear you are investigating their fates. My family and I grew up in Oak Hill Circle, west of the gravesite. The neighborhood was constructed on 1972, and my older sister and brother would often explore the woods in the hollow at Duffy's Cut. They would often find old bottles, chinaware, plates, etc., half buried at the base of the railroad cut, and collect them to bring home. I noticed in some of the press releases that mention was made of ghostly tales tied into the Duffy's Cut site. After many trips to the woods, my sister would store her collection of artifacts in a small crawl space in her closet. While the items were there, the family claims to have experienced visitors knocking on the walls and ceiling at night in her room. The family thought this was very strange for a brand new house to be groaning and creaking. On a few nights, my sister vividly saw what she believed were Asian people dressed in rags looking into her bedroom window on the second floor. Once the artifacts were removed from the house, the visitors no longer appeared. At age 40, my sister is still sticking by her story of the visitors outside her window. I wasn't born until 74 and did not begin exploring the woods around Duffy's Cut until the early 80s. It was then that an elderly couple living along King Road, who often walked their dogs along the trails in the woods, told our group of neighborhood kids the story of the mass grave of railroad workers being located somewhere in the woods. At the time, they said the workers were Irish and Asian. This suddenly gave credence to the Asian ghosts outside my sister's window. It was later, after hearing more facts of the mass grave, that I learned it was only Irish workers who perished at the site. This elderly couple said the gravesite was boxed in by rock walls that rose a few feet high. It was only a matter of days that we found the gravesite and returned, shovels in hand. As curious as 10-year-olds can be, our goal was to prove whether or not there were skeletons buried in this area. After only a couple shovels full of dirt, we were scared off by our consciences and the reality of what we might find. Over the years of exploring the woods in the hollow, we found several depressions and mounds of dirt. These were areas on the east side of the creek at the base of the railroad cut. As kids, we always joked that these were additional ancient graves. I find it very interesting that your investigation has turned to looking for the mass grave off in the hollow and possible depressed areas. In recent years, I have only returned to see the development that has occurred on either side of the hollow by Duffy's Cut. The West Hill side, now part of the housing division adjacent to Oak Hill Circle, was rumored to be the resting place for the railroad's mules and horses. On several occasions, my older brother and his friends found horse bones and skulls from the hillside behind Oak Hill Circle, if my memory serves me correct. The neighborhood kids of Oak Hill Circle took on the task of locating these unfortunate Irish workers over 20 years ago. Luckily, we didn't get far. I hope these stories add to the mystique and lore of the site. I wish you luck with your investigation, and I'll anxiously be keeping close tabs on the media reports as to what is uncovered, literally and figuratively. Then there's the other story about the historical marker that we just mentioned. I'm a resident of Malvern, and after some research on the Duffy's Cut mass grave, I came across your name, Professor William Watson. I read an article that stated that you and a friend named Tom Connor had seen 
elongated glowing shapes and staggered formation outside. You stated that you weren't sure what the forms were, but that you couldn't find a natural source for the light. This brings me to the reason for my email. The whole reason that I had begun to research the Sugartown and King Road intersection was because I had seen something there too on an evening in September. I should mention that although I'm not Irish, I am a Celt. All my immediate family is Scottish, except for one Irish great-grandmother. I'm not a believer in ghosts, although I certainly have seen things I can't explain, and quite a few of them during my lifetime. I'm a historian and writer, and a naturally skeptical individual. I had just turned off King Road onto Sugartown Road when something walked across the road in front of my car. I can describe it as an oblong light, with tendrils of light coming off of it, and it moved with definite purpose towards King Road. I was surprised because any other time I've seen anything odd, it's been a shadow figure. This is the very first time I've seen a light move with purpose. I even stopped my car and watched it as it moved away and faded. At the time, it was about 9.30 p.m. I was not at all tired or distracted. I had no idea that there was a grave site nearby. Although I have driven past that intersection many times, I have never stopped to read the sign posted there in memory of the men who died. A few days later, I noticed the sign and stopped to read it. I did some research online, which led me to you. As I say, I don't know what the light was, and I'm not a great believer in ghosts. I just know that there are many things in the world that mankind cannot explain. Quite a few of them seem to reside in Malvern, though. In the 12 years I have lived here, I've seen and heard quite a lot of things that can't be explained. In any event, I thought you might be interested to hear that you weren't the only ones to see something strange at that intersection. So, do you have hard-to-shop-for relatives and friends? Oh, yeah, my parents. Uh, they're always very grateful and appreciative of everything I get them, of course, but I know if a gift I got them was something that they're not interested in or don't care to figure out, I'll see it in the basement, still in the package. Yep, same here. It'll still be in the box, never <laughs> opened, uh, but you know one gift that's been a hit with everyone we've sent it to? Yep, the skylight frame. That's one gift that's still on their mantle, front and center, and they love it. Everyone seems to love it. Well, everyone loves looking at family photos, and, and we're so glad they're back with us as a sponsor because it really is the perfect gift since it's so easy to set up. All your family and friends can upload photos, and the receiver doesn't have to do anything but enjoy it. If you haven't heard, Skylight Frame is a digital photo frame that you can update instantly by email from anywhere, or your selected peeps can use the app to send pictures to the Skylight, and they'll pop up in seconds. It's a great way to feel close and stay connected with those you love, even when you're separated. And it is so easy to use. It sets up effortlessly in less than a minute. It, just plug it in, use the touchscreen to connect to your wireless network, and, and that's it. And if the folks you want to give one to aren't good with tech, mm. you can preload it with photos <laughs> they'll love. And it makes for an even more meaningful and special gift. Yeah, that's a great idea. So they don't have to do anything but set it where they want it. Plus, it's really an elegant looking black frame with a white mat. So it adds a beautiful touch to any home. And, and speaking of touch... Skylight Frame's vibrant touchscreen display lets you swipe through photos and even tap a heart to let the person who sent the photo know you loved it. And now you can choose from two size options, either the original 10-inch or the new large 15-inch frame. Satisfaction is 100% guaranteed, and if you don't love your Skylight, they'll offer you a full refund. So give the perfect gift this year that won't end up in the basement. And now, as a special offer, you can get $15 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to Skylight Frame dot com and enter the code legends that's right to get fifteen dollars off your purchase of a skylight frame just go to skylightframe.com and enter the code legends that's s-k-y-l-i-g-h-t-f-r-a-m-e dot com promo code legends forest and scott thank you for supporting their sponsors i'm beth and briggs miller now back to the show How did you get from finding your grandfather's, the letter, that particular file, how did you get from that to initiating the dig and the search in the area? Well, that, that's the historical marker thing. I mean, we said, as soon as Frankie showed this to me, I said, we got to get a historical marker here. And so that was the first step. So getting people in to help us with that, 
The whole process is political. Every state congress- congressional district has the permission to have a marker every year, but they only authorize so many of them. And you can see who gets markers and who don't. And I got to say, but at that point, the Irish had no markers in the state, not even the Molly Maguires. They didn't get one up in uh, Jim Thorpe for the Molly Maguires until 2006 that they got a marker up there for the Molly Maguires. And the Molly Maguires are in every single textbook. There was a movie, Hollywood movie, with Richard Harris and Sean Connery. Mm-hmm. You know, why, why didn't they get a marker? Well, anyway, we got that marker as a result of a battle. And simultaneous with that, we reached out to the state archaeology office and got permission right after we got the marker to engage in an archaeological dig. Uh, they determined it not to be a, a an official graveyard, and so we, we had permission to dig. And the guy who gave us that permission and his associates came out finally in 2020 to see what we did in our Duffy's Cut Museum. There is a museum of artifacts of everything we found there uh, located at Immaculata in the Gabriel Library. And then they saw the site, and they saw how we cataloged it, and they gave their thumbs up in 2020. It took all those years. But, uh, yeah, that was really neat. And uh, – it was a battle, though. I mean, it, you know, the entire thing was a battle. And uh, you can't focus on the negatives. you got to focus on the successes. But it, it left an impact on everybody that it was a battle. It shouldn't have been a battle. A mass grave ought to be a slam dunk. And the state, to their credit, you know, has, has recognized it and, and has uh, backed us and uh, can't say anything uh, bad about the Commonwealth now because they have more than made up for whatever the deficiency were in that office. They gave us a proclamation, the state of Pennsylvania, that recognized what happened at Duffy's Cut, that the murders took place. They, you know, it's just, it was really, a uh, Andrew Dinneman uh, spearheaded that for us. And it was one of the most moving things to, to see that, you know, the state officially acknowledges what happened there for these, these poor Irishmen. And, you know, from our perspective, you know, no, telling the truth, you got to tell the truth about this stuff, the good and the bad. The ugly, you know, all of it has to come out. I mean, how are we going to grow as a as a human race unless we're we're honest with ourselves about such things? Let's frame the story a little bit because I, I think people what people should understand is that initially, at least, whether the reason was the cover up or whatever, the initial story was okay. The fifty seven came over. They worked on Duffy's cut, the Earthen Bridge. They do this work, and then suddenly uh, there's a cholera outbreak, and fifty seven people die. And that's notable right out of the gate because the average fatality rate is 40 to 60 percent, maybe an average of 50 percent. So why are all 57 people in this case dying? And then the story that is follows through, uh, you know, throughout the years after that is that they all had cholera. They died of cholera. This is what happened. Then you guys get out and you start to do the excavation. You're finding these artifacts. How many years was it from the time you started to where you found the first set of remains? Seven years. Seven years. Seven years from when we found the site. Okay. To the first body. Five years of digging. You know, seven years overall. But we started in 2004. We started digging. Okay, right. Yeah. So there's a, there, that's what another thing people don't get. I think it's like, you know, it's more than just finding it. Then you got to follow all the protocols for the dig. Oh, yeah. And procedures and everything. So you found the site using ground penetrating radar. Is that correct? Yes. So what, what happened was... Um, we were in the right place at the right time to get the assistance of Dr. Timothy Bechtel, a geophysicist, uh, Franklin and Marshall and at Penn. And he came out and one day Bill and I were walking with him in the valley and he had done geophysical surveys in the valley itself, didn't find anything. And so he was up on the hillside uh, that would have been the original track bed. And he says, well, where else could we look? And then um, I had the copy of the file with me, and I pulled out this letter from an Irish railroader named George Doherty, and I read the, his recollection from his father. His father had said to him um, that he heard they were buried where they were making the fill. That's the the fill is the earthen railroad bridge, the hillside that they built to place the tracks on. And so Dr. Tim Bechtel says to Bill and me, he says, well, Where's the fill? And Bill and I looked at each other and we chuckled and we said, you're standing on it. <laughs> right. That fill, the original fill, didn't have tracks on it anymore, right? Or they moved them? No, they had moved it north. Right. But we found some of the original track there. The importance of Tim getting in on this, someone said, oh, it's an urban myth. They're never going to yeah. find bodies. You know, they first yeah. said, you're not going to, you're not going to get a mark. I've got a mark. You'll get permission. You won't get permission to dig. We got permission to dig. You won't find any bodies. And some guy said it was an urban myth. And so I mentioned that to a um, guy from Penn who um, uh, happened to eventually be president of St. Andrew's Society. He was a geo, uh, what is it, a physicist of some sort down at Penn in his major job. 
Uh, he said, I'll get you somebody. He believed what we were doing. And he, he got us Tim. That's how Tim came in on this. Okay. It was mm -hmm. Drew McGee who said, I've got someone, a scientist to a scientist who got, you know, boom, there you go. But I mean, that was a, it, we could have done this years earlier if we just had the radar. Tim had the expertise because he had done work at uh, Bush Run Battlefield out in the western end of the state, found a skeleton based, you know, figured out all kinds of details from ground penetrating radar at the site of a French and Indian War battle. And yeah, the technology evolved from the earlier part of the dig to when Tim came in in, in 09, or he, Tim came on board, Frankie, in 08. And it was 09, you know, that the, 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 the uh, well, that's the thing, because when we first started this, I mean, who had ever heard of ground penetrating radar, you know? Yeah. And he used what was called electrical resistivity. They were like knitting needles, kind of. They were in the ground, and uh, you would run an electrical current through them. And that's what gave us the image of the first guy was actually electrical resistivity. Fascinating. Yeah, and some of, some of that is in Secrets of the Dead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that image came through. He got that image. He was standing on the fills, Frank said, in December of 08. And he had the data. He ran it on a, on a, a map, a 3D grid for us in March of 2009. It was, it was March 20th, three days after St. Patrick's Day, about two in the afternoon. And two of my students ran up to me and said, Doc, we've got ourselves a bone. And it wasn't anything we'd ever seen before. It looked human. We took it to the biology department. He says, that's absolutely a human leg. So we call all the protocols went into place. We called the cops. The DA and the coroner were informed. Amtrak was informed. The homeowners were informed. We did everything by the book. We still took heat after that. You know, it was like we had to wait a whole month so the dig could resume. But the, the cops out there in the Emerald Society of Chester County helped us hugely to move these uh, mountains of obstacles that appeared in our way. And by God, that year and the following year and the year after that, oof. Yeah. Jenna Monge came out the weekend we found the bone, the first skeleton, and she was able to look at the skull and determine his general age. Um, she looked at his ear canal because his ear canal was intact. She said he had an ear infection when he died. And she looked at the skull and she says, well, if he had cholera, it's not what killed him. I mean, she saw the, the dents in his skull, the, the holes that were put there by physical violence. And she was able to determine that it was uh, perimortem violence that, that killed the first man. That is violence at the time of death, you know, that, that being bashed on the head is basically what, what killed this poor guy. And so she found that with all of the skeletons that we excavated there, that they all died of perimortem violence. And she's able to determine age, you know, so that the first skeleton, she says, was an 18-year-old male. And there's this aha moment when we had that ship list. There's one 18-year-old laborer, John Ruddy of Donegal. And, you know, he's 18 years old, poorest of the poor, you know, coming over with nothing on that ship, ends up buried out there at the cut. And, you know, we had sons, me, Frankie, Earl. It was like, that could have been us. Could've it could have been, been our, our kids, sons. Because our kids were that age, that you site. know. But the other piece of this was we, we started doing genealogical research on the passengers of the John Stamp. Uh, ship list. We had we actually were able to get an original, an image of the original ship list uh, through the National Archives, and we did genealogical research on all of the names. And some of them we know survived. Some of the folks on the ship, there was a descendant of one of the weavers who were on board, um, and we were able to tell him, yes, your ancestors survived, you know. But with most of these laborers, they just disappeared from history. And so this is the thing. So when we looked at the ship list, there were other 18-year-olds. But among the 18-year-olds, there's this one who disappears from history, John Ruddy. And that was the thing because she looked yeah, in, he's a laborer, and she looks at his, well, she and then Matt Patterson, our friend, Dr. Matt Patterson, our forensic dentist, look at the jaw and, he, and they say he's missing his upper right front molar. And so this dental anomaly becomes very significant for us. Um, it's a very rare condition, M1A genesis, and it became very significant for us in helping to track down descendants of, of this man. That was a question I had. You just answered it before I could ask it was, how did you know that was ruddy? Because there had to be more 18-year-olds mm -hmm. on the ship. So th that explains that. Yeah. But this other thing here to keep in mind is that nobody could have been buried in that fill prior to 
the time of the railroad. That railroad created the fill. No one could have been buried there prior to 1832. And once the railroad opens up in 1834, no one's going to be buried there either in an existing rail line. You got a very narrow time frame. And the only work crew who actually lived in that valley was Duffy's crew. The later crews lived in Garrett Siding and Frazier, closer to Immaculata uh, than Duffy's crew, who actually were living there on site. So those are the only people in the world these guys could have been. All right. So here we have some questions then. I mean, the questions that are presented by these circumstances. I mean, the first thing is the story was, at least for a long time, was that they had contracted cholera and they all died of cholera, which, as I said, statistically, that seemed unlikely. So even when you you guys finished this first book, you were speculating about the possibility of violence to them, but you didn't have any remains at that point. You didn't have any proof of that. Was that speculation based on things you had heard or uncovered, or was it was it just a hunch? Well, that's the cops said yeah, that. Because the fact that none of these folks, again, the genealogical searches that we did on these names, they didn't survive. They didn't make it in America, you know? And so we knew that they disappeared. And the thing is, we also knew from other 1832 accounts of the building of the railroad, that violence happened along the um, the lines of the various railroads, in particular the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, the sister railroad to the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad. There were there were faction fights. There was violence with uh, folks in the communities, but in no situation that we were able to uncover was there a complete um, disappearance of an entire work crew. And that's what got us speculating. Bill and our, our colleagues, John and Earl, why don't you see them in the 1850 and 1860 census records? Why would you lose an entire work crew? <laughs> That's going to wrap up part one of our series on the massacre at Duffy's Cut. A very special thanks to Frank and Bill Watson. Join our Patreon to hear us on the much more candid Astonishing Junk Drawer, which most of the time we do live on video for our patrons. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Our technical producer is Ed Vicola, or as we call him, the mechanic. Special thanks to our announcer, John Boland. Hi, I'm Rachel Parsons. Hi, I'm Bethan Briggs Miller. However they see fit. Galaxy wide in perpetuity. Perpetuity. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at foundermusic.com. All other music and sound design for the show is composed and created by Alan Caressia. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at deadstreetproductions.com. Every episode going back to September of 2020 has a transcription available on its corresponding webpage at our website. Earlier transcriptions can be made available upon request to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, Astonishing Junk Drawer, which is available every week the main show is not. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>